Who loves the word? We got some word lovers. Uh, I, I love the Bible. And uh, we've been doing, I've been doing a uh, sermon series on discipleship. And I want to talk about uh, the word of God. Amen. Uh, I, um, <clears throat> we've, we've, uh, the last two messages I've done on this discipleship journey uh, has been around the Holy Spirit. Jesus talked a lot about the Holy Spirit. Um, we talk a lot about the Holy Spirit. Uh, it is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Bible. It's actually the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, and we, we believe uh, in the, the Spirit and the truth. Uh, and I want to kind of unpack that some today. Uh, I might take another shot at this in a couple weeks. Uh, next week, Thomas and Christina Blackman are going to be here. Uh, they actually led uh, the healing rooms at Bethel for, I mean, it's probably somewhere in the 10 year range. Uh, really have a grace and have walked and seen a lot of breakthrough and miracles. So if you know anybody that, that needs a miracle in their body, uh, bring them to more night next Saturday and then bring them again on Sunday, next, uh, next Sunday morning. Going to be a powerful time. Um, but the, uh, the Holy Spirit and the Bible. Um, I, I, I would say even in the past three years, I've always had a deep love and value for the Word. Um, but I would say that in the past probably, I don't know, maybe three to four years, my value for the Word of God has just increased so much. And I, I don't know if it's because the world has gotten more, more chaotic, and I've, I've seen the impact of truth in my own life, and the truth of, or, or the impact of reading the Bible in my own life, and allowing His Word to impact me. Um, but I, I just love this book. I, I remember when I first got saved, uh, I had this hunger for God. I just wanted more of his presence. I wanted to experience more of God. And I remember I would just lay up at night and laid into the, uh, laid into the night and just read the Bible and just read it and read it and read it and just take in the word of God. And <clears throat> I, I feel like there's been a renewed passion for the Bible for me uh, within the past three years. And so I'm going to go after this. Uh, discipleship, I, I believe that our greatest call is to be a follower of Jesus. I believe above uh, everything flows out of that. My ministry flows out of that. Even my marriage flows out of that. Raising my kids flows out of that. It's, it's Jesus and then it's everything else. And I'm a better dad. I'm a better husband. I'm a better pastor. I'm a better, I'm not a businessman, but you're a better businessman. You're a better doctor, lawyer, teacher, whatever it is. Uh, Jesus knows how to do that better than we do. And following him, um, what, what that's going to do is when I follow him, I'm, I'm not only going to have the right stance, but I'm going to be of the right spirit. I'm going to be of the right spirit. I'm going to walk with the character and the heart of God, and his nature is, is, is going to flow out of me because I'm walking with him. And so uh, following Jesus is it's the greatest call for any of us, and it's the best thing that any of us could do in our life. If, if I'm not following him, uh, I encourage you to get on the train. <laughs> I encourage you to, 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 to lay down my life to, and yield my life to him and surrender to him um, because I, there's just nothing better than knowing Jesus. It's where life is. It's where peace is. It's where truth is. And, and it's so good to follow him. So um, out of that, um, we've, got, we've talked about the Holy Spirit, um, but I want to talk about the importance. If I'm going to be a disciple of Christ, I think it's important, uh, very important, that I get in his word. Um, you, know who, uh, you know Benny Hinn? <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, I, love, I like some Benny Hinn. But Benny Hinn said this. Benny said, he said, if you only have the word, you'll dry up. If you only have the spirit, you'll blow up. <laughs> <laughs> if you have the word and the spirit, you'll grow up. Isn't that good? If you only have the word, you'll dry up. If you only have the spirit, you'll blow up. <laughs> but if you have the word and the spirit, you'll grow up. I, I want to toot our horn. I know I'm tooting our horns, but um, I just saw this. I thought it was fascinating to me because, um, you know, usually the criticism against charismatics is, is that we... You know, we're not in the Bible. Um, you know, we're only in the Spirit. And, and, and there's, you know, there's some good feedback there for us. Um, but, um, but there's a study that Barna Group did. I thought this was pretty fascinating. Barna Group did a, a study, and it was, it was interesting because I think it was something like they said surprising findings. 
things that they were surprised by. And this was one of the things they were surprised by. This was what they found. Adults, that's you and me, who attend charismatic or Pentecostal church were more likely to possess biblical beliefs than those attending other Protestant or Catholic churches. Let's go charismatics. Come on, where are we at? There we go. That's us, baby. We're in the Bible. (laughs) I was like, amen. Amen. Because, I mean, I will say this from my own personal experience of being around, and I've been around a lot of charismatics, um, and there are some of us that maybe aren't in the Bible enough, amen, um, but my experience is a lot of the places that I've been around is, is these people are just hungry for the Word of God. People I hang out with in this room, like, are, are they're hungry for the Bible. They want to, and, and not only are they hungry for it, they want to live it out, you want to actually live this out. And I believe our Protestant brothers and sisters do too. Come on. Um, and we're, we're part of that group as well, somehow. We're in there. Um, so, um, <clears throat> the purpose of the Word. I think we see this all the way back in the beginning. If you, if you go back to, to Genesis, um, and the, the, it says the earth was formless, it was void, and darkness covered the deep. Uh, pretty much sounds like us before we find Jesus. It's pretty much a, a salvation message right there. But there's, we, we don't have identity. We're empty. We're living in darkness. We're not living in the light. And what does it say? It says that the, the Spirit was hovering over the deep. And then God said, let there be light. What's interesting is, is he didn't, the, the sun wasn't created yet. Uh, that, that came later on. Uh, but, but the first thing he said is, let there be light. And if you look up that word light in Hebrew, it means to bring order to chaos. And what, what did God do? All of a sudden, in Genesis, he started to bring order to chaos. He took something that was void, that was empty and dark, and he began to form it, and he gave it purpose, and he created the plants and the birds and the animals and you know, and he gave them all purpose. He blessed them so that they would have life, and they began to produce life, and it was life-giving. Um, and, and this is what the Word does. This is, what, this is what God does to us, is he takes something that is in chaos, and he puts it in order. And we, we need that, that the Word, um, it, it guides me. Um, it is a, a lamp under my feet. It is a light under my path. I need the Word of God in my life so that, I, so that darkness can be exposed and that I can be set free, so that um, I can learn about who I am in God and I can learn about the ways of God. And this gives light unto my path. This helps me walk in the light to understand the Bible. And so <clears throat> the Bible is really significant. I'm gonna <clears throat> read this in Psalms, um, you don't have to go there, but I'll read this real quick. Listen to this language. Psalms 119, 105, it says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. I have taken an oath and confirmed it, that I will follow your righteous laws. I just, I love this powerful language here. I have taken an oath and confirmed it, that I will follow your righteous laws. I have suffered much, Preserve my life, O Lord, according to your word. We need the word to preserve us. Preserve my life, O Lord, according to your word. Accept, O Lord, the willing praise of my mouth and teach me your laws. Though I constantly take my life, though I constantly take my life in my hands, I will not forget your law. The wicked will have a snare for me, but I have not strayed from your precepts. Your statutes are my heritage forever. I love that. Your statutes are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart. My heart is set. And I think this is the the heart posture. My heart is set on keeping your decrees to the very end. My heart is set on keeping your decrees until the very end. Um, The word is so significant. The word, it reveals to us who God is, and it reveals <clears throat> to us his ways. You know, it's the, the spirit. I want to uh, talk about this again, but it's the spirit and truth working together that reveal the truth to us. Um, you know, the, uh, if I don't have the spirit, <clears throat> let me say it this way. It takes the spirit of God and the word of God to equal tr- truth. The Bible 
in the hands of the devil is not true or, or perverted. You know, the Bible in the hands of the devil is not true or perverted. You know, there was a time in Scripture where the devil used the, the Scripture against Jesus. If you read this in the, in the, where he was tempted in the wilderness, it says the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the enemy. If you go through there, the enemy, actually the devil, uses the Scripture against God. So think about it. I mean, you can look all throughout church history, and um, people have misused the Bible. People have, have used the Bible uh, in the wrong spirit. I mean, this is political. You know, I mean, this can be the political thing. I might have the right issue, but the wrong heart. I mean, you might have the, the wrong issue in the right heart. You might just want to get the right issue, you know. <laughs> um, but it's, it's what spirit am I of? And it's the spirit and the truth working together um, that really reveals the true truth to us, that reveals the actual truth to us so that it's not perverted like the enemy did. Um, I remember, y'all remember the mask days? You know, everybody, we all had to wear a mask, that whole thing. Personally for Jonathan, I know for, for me, wearing a mask, it was just challenging. I didn't like it. I, I probably just didn't like being told what to do. It was just probably a trigger for me. And I just didn't, I'd wear it and I just couldn't breathe and it just bothered me. And it was, a, so that was a, a, tr- a, a frustrating part for me. <laughs> but I remember I listened to Bill Johnson and he said something and it stuck out to me. And he just said, <clears throat> if you wear the mask, wear it in the spirit of Christ. If you don't wear the mask, wear it in the spirit of Christ. And there's, there's something just, just powerful about that. It's like, what spirit am I of? And is it the Holy Spirit? When I read the Bible... I want to read it with God. You know, it's, it, the Bible without God and just man can be a problem. The Bible with God and with Holy Spirit, that is where truth is going to be revealed. And it's important that we're reading the Bible with the goal to know the author. Uh, like, I believe that the primary purpose of the word is to know God. It's not just to know about him, but it's actually to know God And how many of you know that truth um, is a person? I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's what Jesus said. I am the way, the truth, and the life. So truth, by design, is meant to be encounter. It's meant to be relational. If the Bible is not relational, then it becomes legalistic. If I lose the relationship part of it, it becomes legalistic. If it, I love memorizing scripture. I think memorize, which I'm, I don't know that I actually do that a whole lot, but um, I'm, I'm for memorizing scripture. I read the Bible, um, but if it was all about memorizing scripture, the Pharisees would have rocked. If it was all about memorizing scripture, then the Pharisees would have been home run hitters. But they, they, they didn't know the author. The author showed up and they didn't recognize him because they didn't know the author. And that Jesus worked this with them. He was like, look, they're like, hey, we're of Abraham. We're of these guys. And he's like, look, if you were truly following the God of Moses and Abraham, then you would know me. You would know that I come from God. If you had a relationship with me, then you would know that. So the point is, is that we could know the Bible backwards and forwards and not know the author. But we should know the Bible, you know, backwards and forwards and know the author. <laughs> it's like we want both of those. Um, some, some foundations for me as I approach the scripture is, I, I love this, um, Jesus is perfect theology. Jesus is, uh, I've got some scripture here, Colossians, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Hebrews 1.3, this one just sums it up really well. The sun is the radiance, talking about Jesus, uh, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. He is the exact representation of his being. Jesus even said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So who is our, our escort through Scripture? It's Jesus. Any, anytime, you know, I'm, I'm not, uh, Job is not perfect theology. Jesus is perfect theology. Yes, I can learn about God from Job. I can learn. There's revelation in there. It's in there for a reason. There is... Um, things for us to learn that reveal things about God. But I, it's important that I am always looking through the lens of Jesus. This helps me because if I ever get to a point in Scripture where I'm a, I don't understand or I'm like, this, this is difficult for me, I'm going to go back to what did Jesus say? Because he is the perfect representation of God. He is the image of God, and I'm going to look through the, the lens of that. Number two for me, uh, context, if I'm reading the scriptures, context is important. 
Um, you know, they didn't originally have uh, chapters and verses that came along later that, you know, when you read, especially in the New Testament, Paul's epistles, they're, they're letters. They're really meant to be read from, from the beginning until the end. And um, so when I'm reading scripture, yes, sometimes I will pick a scripture or a chapter and read through a chapter, but I also understand, and, and one of my strengths on the strength finder, it's kind of a strength and a weakness, is context. Uh, I, I, I get in trouble because I want so much context. I'm like, I start reading like the 15 chapters before, and then I'm not even at what I'm teaching on because I'm trying to understand like, what is the context? What is, what is the actual purpose of this scripture? What is God trying to reveal in this scripture? And so context is really, really key for me as I'm, I'm approaching the Bible. And it's important for me to read with the Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, spirit, one of the definitions of spirit is breath. It's the breath of God. And so when I'm reading, and I know you, you've, you've experienced this probably, but I love it when I'm reading through the scripture and all of a sudden you feel the breath of God on a scripture. You feel the Holy Spirit take something and he is just breathing on it and you feel it. And he's, what he's really doing is he's breathing it in you. The word is now reading me. And I, I, am, I am experiencing that word. That word is alive and it's impacting my life. So reading with the Holy Spirit, that is as simple as when I'm opening the Bible. I feel like for me, it's just a heart posture, um, but it can be a prayer. Holy Spirit, let's read this together. I wanna, as I'm reading through the word, Lord, teach me. Breathe on your scripture. The other thing that I think is really important is I let the word define me, not me define the word. Um, that, that, that is, uh, it's, it's a big deal to, to let, like God is the one that's defining me. I'm not defining God. Um, I think sometimes we take the scriptures, we, we all do this to some degree, but we've got our goggles on. We've got our lenses that we're reading the scripture through. Like in our world, we sometimes, I think a lot of times because of, of, of the season of Christianity that we've grown up in, we're looking at things in a heaven and hell lens. That's what salvation is in our minds, like heaven and hell. There is a heaven and hell. That there is truth to that. But what, what can happen, I find myself doing this, is every parable is about heaven and hell. You know, every parable is not about heaven and hell. But, but in, if the lens that I'm taking, it's like I'm looking through it through a, a lens that I'm already wearing, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm in a sense, I'm kind of imposing that onto the Scripture. And I think it's important to allow, like, Holy Spirit, what are, what are you trying to teach? What is, what is going on? What is the purpose of this message, and what do you want to speak to me? Um, personally, I do love the, the historical church and learn, reading about what people fought through the thousands of years of Christianity about Scripture, and there is so much there. And, and a lot of that is really beautiful um, because this book and theology and Christianity um, – it's a big, it's a big club in a sense, because there's been years and years and years and years and years and studying and thought process and people, um, you know, expounding upon the truth. And there's a lot of really good that's in there. And and what's awesome is, is it's tested the, uh, it's tested the time. How am I trying to say that? Test what? Stood the test of time. A little tongue twister for me. Um, <clears throat> so the truth is meant to set us free. Um, you know, oftentimes, if there's something that we are, we're good with, we'll amen it, which is good. You know, it's, it's good. Like, there'll be truths that we're like, you know, Jesus is Lord. Amen. Come on, that's awesome. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll amen because it, it's, it's, it's true and it's good and we're, we're in a good spot with that. But you want to know most of the time where we need truth is probably in our pain. It's in our dysfunction. It's in the place where, the, where there's darkness. It's in the place where something needs to be exposed. And it's like there's a lie that I'm believing. There's a, a pattern that I'm living in. There's, and typically, probably more times than not, something happened. There was pain. There was trauma. Something I believe God for it didn't happen. I've continually dealt with rejection. What, whatever it is, there's, a, there's, a, there's something there. And usually where we need truth is in that spot. Where we're good, again, it's like it's easy. It's like, come on, that's awesome. Preacher's preaching my message. I love it when he talks about the kingdom. I love it when he talks about the Holy Spirit. I love it when he talks about the word of God. Whatever it is, we're amen in that. But usually where I need the truth is, is in the places of dysfunction. And where is the hardest place to hear the truth <laughs> is in my dysfunction. Where am I defensive? Where am I 
judging where where do all of a sudden I start getting big and anxious and 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 I've got to defend myself and prove myself it's it's in the place of dysfunction there's somebody Jesus here in the word where he spoke some truth in love if y'all y'all know the story of the rich young man I think he's known as the rich young ruler um <clears throat> I'll read this for us, but it's a beautiful story. But this is in Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, this rich young man comes running up to Jesus. And he's got some truth that he loves. There's some things that that he loves, but then there's some dysfunction. And there's something very beautiful in here that I think reveals the nature of God. So in Mark 10, it says, And he was setting out on his journey. A man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to, in, to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. So here's what he agrees with. <laughs> do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. You know, so if this rich young man's sitting in a service and you're like, honor your father and mother, it's like, come on, that's awesome. Yes, amen. And he said to him, teacher, all these things, so this is the young man, he's talking to Jesus, says, and teacher, all these things I've kept kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, listen to this, loved him. Jesus, looking at him, loved him. The, uh, the Passion Translation, I want to read this. It says, Jesus fixed his gaze upon the man with tender love. So think about it. Jesus knows he's about to reveal some truth to him that's probably going to offend him. But what I love about Jesus here is it says that he loved him. He loved this man. What's powerful about that is that love led Jesus to tell him the truth in love. Jesus didn't, because I think oftentimes we can land in one of three spots. We can land in the spot where it's like, and this is usually our more compassionate people by nature, by personality, and that's obviously a part of God, but it's, um, and this can be me, is we avoid it. I I don't want to speak the truth because I don't want to rock the boat. I want to keep the peace. Um, I, I, I really, I want them to like me. I think if I tell them the truth right now, they might turn away and walk away. I, I want to be liked. I want to be loved. And so I'm avoiding the truth. Um, then there's the spot of, I, it's not that I love speaking the truth in love. It's just I love speaking the truth. And I do it without love. I just love speaking the truth. And so I, the, the, the goal of me speaking the truth is not I love you. It's I want to... I want to trump you. I want to. Um, I want to. I want to one up you. I want to win the argument. I want to. You know. I want to. I want to win. And it's not actually about the value that I have for the person. Like, am I actually? Do I actually care about them? And because Jesus looked at this man, and I could only imagine that he was probably exuding. Like you could probably feel the love in his eyes, and he knew that I'm about to say something that's going to hit his dysfunction. I'm about to speak some truth here that he's not going to like, that is going to be hard for him. What I love is we don't know what ended up happening to this guy. It says he's a young man. You know, I don't don't think this is a a narrative that, um, a story that, I think this is Jesus addressing one man. Um, I don't think this is a story that God's saying it's, you know, it's it's wrong to be rich. He, He goes on in the story to say, people that follow me, that have given up families, houses, whatever, that he says that all of that will be returned back to you a hundred times in this life. He says that in this present age, not just in heaven, but he actually goes on to say that if you, you, you follow me, then I want to bless your families. Like, I want to bless your business. I want, I want to bring a blessing to who you are. But I think G, there was something that, in a sense, was uh, between his relationship with God and him. There was a dysfunction there that Jesus was going after. And I love how Jesus, in love, what love did is it led him to speak the truth in love. And that's powerful. How many many of you know that we need friends and we need fathers and we need the word of God to speak the truth to us? We need it in our dysfunction, in our places where we've gotten off, in our places where we've empowered lies in our life. Like, that is where I need the truth. 
season in my life where I was in, in the word and I was doing my devotion and I was in a, in a tough season of my life and I'm reading the Bible and there's a, a phrase that's in Isaiah and it says, in quietness and trust is your strength. In quietness and trust is your strength. In, in this season, um, <clears throat> this was five years ago, I was, um, my, my marriage was struggling because I was struggling with uh, pornography. Um, I was a pastor. I was a father. And I had, um, we ended up kind of stepping down from the, the pulpit um, and from my leadership position so that I could work on my relationship with Kate, so that I could work on my relationship with myself and with God. And um, it was it was a tough spot because we had, you know, we're probably two years into launching the church. The church is actually, it's kind of got this fresh momentum, like people are coming, it's this fun place, like God's, God's really moving. We just got this kind of new location in downtown Birmingham. And, and I remember, like, I, it, even though this wasn't fully true, it felt this way. To me, it felt like everything that I was building in my life was getting ripped away from me. It felt that way. I remember, and it, for me, powerlessness, it, 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 it hit powerlessness right in the face for me because I felt so powerless. I felt, and obviously it was my actions, my, you know, it was my behavior that was causing this. But I remember in that, in that season, like, you know, we had an awesome team. Our trustees were stepping in and helping. Um, but, you know, you're just in that place where decisions are getting made without you. Things are just happening. And it's like, I have, I felt like I had no control. And it, in a sense, I, I felt like, I was losing it, and it was kind of a little bit like an, um, an Isaac moment for me, where the dream, the thing that I'd, I'd, I'd fought for, my family, my, um, the church, and what I felt called to do was, was sitting there, and it had to die. And it was like all of that was before me. And <clears throat> I remember in that, that season, what peace, what I believed peace would have felt like was if I can just get my marriage back together, if I can just get back into leadership, I'll have peace. If I can just get the boat back together, then I'm going to have peace. How many of you know that's not true? That's, that's just not true. The, the, the thing that I had to wrestle with was before I have the outcome, I've got to trust God. Before I have the, the, the pulpit, before I have my, my family, before I've, I've got, there's something inside of me. There's a powerlessness and a scared little boy that is freaking out. And he has got to learn how to trust God. He has got to learn how to, no matter what. I remember I was in a counseling session with somebody that really helped me. And I'm over there just running around in circles in my head, worried about this, worried about this. They're doing that. They're doing this. And I'm just in this, just, it's a beautiful place. <laughs> just this place of encouragement where I'm really building myself up. And it's just like, you know, you're really trusting the word. <laughs> and, and it's like, and I'm just in this, and, and my, this guy said, well, tell me this. If the, the worst thing possible happened, would you be okay? And that was the place that I had to wrestle with. Like, it, would I be, a, could I trust God? What I had to, is my peace found in God or is it found in my marriage? Is it found in my leadership, in my ministry? Where is my strength coming from? And that was the thing. I had to wrestle with that, losing everything. And the, the, Beautiful thing is, is that as I, I took, and I remember reading that scripture, and that thing just, it was a, it was a verse that I just continually kept coming back to because I was like, I got to quiet my mind. I got to stop it. There's just things I got to stop. I got to stop thinking this way, and I've got to trust God. And as I did that, what I found is, is that I'm stronger than I know. Like, obviously, it's with God. It's his grace. Uh, that verse really stuck out to me in that and it's in the context of God's grace. But it says, where you are weak, you will be strong. And if you can w wrestle with God, in a sense, in those weak places, because what happens is this is just what happens is we have discouragement, we have disappointment. Where that is leading to is in the sin that that actually leads to. And, it, and Jesus calls the sin is unbelief, where I stop believing. I, I stop trusting God. It, that, that's where the pain, when I'm, when I'm in pain, here's what I need to do when I'm in pain. 
when I'm in pain, I'm in hurt, I'm in, or whatever it is, that thing that I'm defending, I, I, I need to let the word and the breath of God speak to that place. I need to let him, his word, I need to let in quietness and trust, Jonathan, is your strength. That's where your strength is. Not, not, your strength's not in an outcome. Your strength, because if I don't encounter God there, because what does the Bible say? You shall know the truth. The question is, does your pain know the truth? Does your pain know the truth? Does that, is, does that know? Because if that knows the truth, what's it going to do? It's going to set you free. But if, if I don't know the truth and I, I believe a lie, I empower a lie right there. People don't love me. I'm not enough. I've, I've got to fend for myself. I've, I've got to control this situation, whatever it is. Like, it's going to take me to a place where I'm not believing God. I'm, not, I'm believing in Jonathan. I'm not trusting God. And, and what does this make me over here? This makes me weak. This makes me, when I'm doing that, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm jello. And I, I remember one of my counselors telling me that. It's like, yeah, you're like jello. It's like you can't, you're dodging, you're, you know, you're, there, there's no, there's no, you're not standing on your own two feet and in, in strength because you trust God. And <clears throat> that is so, it, but it comes back to God wants to love us. You know what? He accepts us right where we are. He's actually not trying to shame us. That's the problem is sometimes for me, that was it. I was like, I got to go back to performance. I got to, I got to go make everything right. I got to go get this. If I can, I got to get myself right. I got to, you know, prop myself back up in ministry where everybody sees me and they like me and I look good and all of that stuff. It's like trying to hold a, a beach volleyball under the water. You're just like, you can't, you know, you're just trying to manage that on your own instead of just letting that thing go and just trust in God. And I'm going to trust him and I'm going to let his word, what am I, I'm going to let his word do what? Bring order to chaos. I'm going to let his word guide me and lead me, and I'm going to meditate on. I, it's in quietness and strength. It's in quietness and trust is my strength. And when I do that, again, it's a, what happens? Strength. You get strength. You, you get where you were weak, now you're strong. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm able to show up, and it's like it's not so much on an outcome. I'm trusting God. And, and what happens is, is, is all of a sudden the, the, the outcomes happen. <laughs> You know, it's like God, it's like God says, he's like, I'll, I'll, to this rich, young, you know, he says this to his disciple. You're like, well, Jesus, maybe you should have told that to the rich, young girl. <laughs> but he tells his disciples, because they're all like confused, because they're like, well, we've given up, you know, this, that, and the other. And, you know, who can be saved? And, and in a sense, Jesus is like, well, if you follow me, you give up your life, you yield yourself to me, you're, I'm going to bless you in this life too. Yes, there's an eternal life, but I'm going to bless you in this life. Your marriages are going to be better. Your family's going to be better. Your business is going to be better. If, if you can yield yourself to me and trust me, I'm going to guide you in the path of righteousness in life. If you're able, can you stand with me? I just I want to pray over you. You know, two, two, two things. I just kind of felt led to go down that path today, but um, I, I pray that we... we grow a, a heart for the word of God. And that I pray that today that, that there's a, a, a new hunger for his word and for his spirit moving in our life. Um, I also want to just pray for you that if, 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 as I was speaking, if there's any places of pain, the truth is we all have them. The, every, everybody's got the, the rich young ruler. There's somewhere in our lives that there's, Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit to be tempted by the enemy. And there's something about, it says that when he went in, he was led by the Spirit. It says when he, after he was tempted and overcame the enemy, it says he walked out in the power of the Spirit. And there's just things in our lives that we have to face, that God actually wants us. He's not, we're not avoiding those things. We're not, he's not taking us around those things, but he's actually taking us right, <laughs> right in front of it, where it's like, I've got to confront this in my life. I've got to re confront rejection. I've got to confront the lie that I'm not enough. I've got to confront maybe whatever that is for me that just paralyzes me in a sense of I've got to learn to trust God. And so Holy Spirit, I just pray over us Whatever that is in our lives, is there something there that some truth that God just wants, that you want to breathe on today? That there is some truth 
of your word. It's all right in the Bible. That's why the Bible is so significant. It's all right there. That there's truth about who we are. Truth about trusting you. God, there's truth about us letting go of control, letting go of manipulation, letting go of have, uh, having to be all big when I'm really just hurt on the inside. And Lord, letting you breathe into our hearts the truth and the love of God that you have for us. And so Holy Spirit, I pray all over this room, wherever there's places that we need some truth. We need some truth and love. God, again, this is Jesus. Jesus is looking at you with love in his eyes. He's looking at you. This is not shame. This is not talking down to you. He's looking at you with love. And he's saying, hey, all, all it is, you need to give that up and just yield it to me. It's just give that to me and trust me with it. You can trust me. I just want to give us a minute for that. Holy Spirit, breathe in the room. Holy Spirit, we just yield to you. We yield to what you're doing right now, Father. I, f I feel, I, I, I kind of, I get a sense of even places when we were children. He can go all the way back to where we learned a lie, where we empowered a lie, and we started to live out of a false version of ourselves. And he wants to replace that with truth that you are enough, that you are loved, that you are a rock, that you, I just feel this, I don't know, I feel this in my bones, that you are a man, <laughs> that, you are a, that you're, a, you're a powerful woman, that you are a, a man, that you are chosen by God, that he picked you, that even in the place where you felt left and abandoned, that he, he was there that he loves us in those places. And that, that these, some of these things, it's not his heart, but it's like, God, he loves us in those places where, <clears throat> where we were hurt. I felt this phrase. I just feel like God's taken the sting away. He's taken the sting away of, of, of that pain. Thank you, Holy Spirit.